Thanks so much. Well, as I heard, uh, I am a prophet, Miguel, so let me start with a professorial story for you. One day, uh, a prof wanted to make uh, an argument, an impact on an audience, very much like this. So he walks over to the side of the lecture room and he picks up a bottle with a wriggling live worm in it. And he pours in a little bit of tobacco juice and the worm dies. He picks up another jar with another worm in it, pours in a little bit of chocolate syrup and the worm dies. And does it one more time with a little bit of alcohol and the worm dies. And then he looks out at the audience, says, what do you make of that? And one student in the back starts waving his hands and says, sir, sir, I know, I know. If you drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, you don't have to worry about worms. <laughs> well, of course, there's a point to that story, and the point is that he had made the right observation, but he came to the wrong conclusion. And science is all about making observations and coming to conclusions. And that is exactly what we do through our office at McGill. We try to cast light into the dark shadows of the world of pseudoscience. And we do this without any conflict of interest. We do not accept any funding from any vested source. It makes no difference to me, my colleagues, or my staff whether or not any substance, be it a pesticide, a cosmetic, a drug, or a food additive, is regulated or not. The only thing that matters is that whatever decision is arrived at is arrived at based on proper scientific methodology, not on hearsay and not on emotion. So about 19 years ago, McGill said that our job is not over the moment our students graduate and pass out onto the streets of Montreal. Today, we have an obligation because there's such hunger out there for scientific information among the general public that if it isn't fulfilled in a proper, unbiased scientific way, they will end up listening to whoever is standing on top of the tallest soapbox yelling the loudest. And unfortunately, those tend to be the quacks. And they are admittedly quite good at quacking. They know what they're doing. They're harder to recognize because they have cloaked themselves in the garb of science. And they have learned to spout pseudoscientific lingo. They're getting bigger and bigger, and it is getting to be harder and harder to argue with them and to overturn their cockamamie ideas. It is quite a challenge to try to do that because they are everywhere, numerous guises, and sometimes difficult to recognize. So our task is to try to demystify science, to try to make sure that people are up to date on what happens in the world of science. We hope to foster critical thinking, separate sense from nonsense. If all of that works, keep people out of the clutches of charlatans. And when we first started this venture many years ago, I thought we needed a logo and I suggested this one to the university. Don't get all scared, we are not against eating meat. What we're against is this commodity, which is being piled higher and deeper, and it's getting to be harder and harder to dig out from underneath it. It's absolutely everywhere. You can go to your local health food store and buy some aerobic oxygen. I'm not sure where you would go to buy anaerobic oxygen, but you buy the aerobic variety here. And they will tell you that you really need to supplement your life with oxygen because the oxygen content of the atmosphere is decreasing because of all the pollutants we are spewing out. And oxygen, of course, is essential to life. So they tell you that you put a few drops of this into a glass of water and drink it every day to supplement your oxygen intake. Now, this is folly on so many different levels. First of all, of course, we do not breathe through our guts. Uh, second, the amount of oxygen that is available from here is trivial. They have a smidgen of potassium chlorate in there, which in theory can release some oxygen. Of course, it's an inconsequential uh, amount. So they will tell you about the importance of supplementing your life with oxygen because the atmosphere is decreasing, which of course is total nonsense. Uh, pollution ob obviously has all kinds of consequences, but decreasing the oxygen content of the atmosphere is not one of them. Then, curiously, after they get through telling you how important oxygen is and all the good things it does in the body, you look on the next shelf and they will sell you antioxidants. 
and they will tell you of all the horrible things that oxygen can do in your body, create all the free radicals which are precipitating our demise. How does this happen? Because unfortunately, we have failed with scientific education. We have a largely scientifically illiterate public, and you can sell them anything. You can sell them dehydrated water. Just put a few drops into, I'm not sure what, in order to reconstitute it. It is everywhere. You can go on Netflix and see this atrocious movie. It's very compelling because, as I said, the quacks are very good at what they do. And on, in this film, they will tell you not to ever give eggs to your children because it is like giving them cigarettes. But I said they're good with their visuals. It's very, very compelling. What's their argument? That eggs contain dioxin. And dioxin, of course, is horribly toxic. Well, they're right about that. Dioxin is horribly toxic. But of course, it's a question of amount. Dioxin is never produced on purpose. It is a byproduct of industrial processes, but it does contaminate our life. That's true. How much in eggs? Very, very little. Of all the dioxin we take in, which is not significant anyway, it's so little, but only 4% come from eggs. And yet this movie has been very successful in sending the message that eggs are dangerous. And of course, these organizations are out there scaring the public about all kinds of things. They tell you that, that eating bacon is like smoking because it is linked to cancer. Well, we'll have a few words to say about that because this comes from the International Agents uh, Research on Cancers Analysis, which is a hazard and not a risk analysis, and that is going to be an important point to, to make. So of course, what they want are chemical-free products. That's what the activists want. And as you can imagine, uh, to a chemistry professor, this is like taking a knife and sticking it into you. Uh, this is the height of absurdity. Nothing in the world, of course, is chemical-free. Chemicals are just the basic building blocks of all matter. You cannot be chemical-free. Even this jar, empty as it is, is not chemical-free because it is full of air. And air, of course, has all sorts of chemicals in there. But unfortunately, because of this kind of nonsensical propaganda, the word chemical has become synonymous with poison and with toxin. And of course, it creates fear in, in people. Uh, the, the fear is, is uh, very captivating because they will tell you that chemists are you know, unholy people who are locked up in a laboratory somewhere just thinking about what new cancer-causing substance to unleash on the unsuspecting public. And that chemicals, of course, are atrocious things that kill us. Now, why, of course, we would want to kill off our customers, that is a completely different kind of a, a, a question. But there is great panic out there, and people are confused, they're perplexed, they are bewildered, because there indeed seems to be so much confusing information out there. The fact is, we make chemical decisions numerous times during the day. Many times we come to the proverbial fork in the road. We have to make a decision. You wake up in the morning, you have to decide, is it going to be coffee or tea? Which kind of coffee? Decaf or regular? And if decaf, what kind of decaf? Is the caffeine going to be removed by the Swiss water process or by the dry cleaning process? For lunch, what is it going to be? Is it going to be smoked meat? Is it going to be pizza? These are scientific decisions. What are you going to drink with it? Water, what kind of water? Bottled water, tap water, filtered water, diet drinks, sugar sweetened drinks, supper, you're gonna cook in what? Copper pots, stainless steel, aluminum? Concerns, people have heard of the link between aluminum and Alzheimer's disease. Well, I've been cooking in aluminum all my life and I can't remember any problems. <laughs> so these are, these are all chemical decisions that we make. And it requires an understanding of the fundamentals of, of science. Chemicals are not to be feared. Of course, they are not to be worshipped either. They're not good or bad. They don't make any decisions. What we need to do is understand them. We need to understand that we live in a world that is constructed of chemicals, a large number of them. Chemical abstracts, lists 134 different chemical, million different chemical entities. That's a stunning number. Of course, 
most of these, 99.9% .9 are natural, but that is not what gets the publicity. What gets the publicity are the synthetic chemicals, which of course are seen as being some sort of, of uh, uh, horrific uh, environmental catastrophe. The fact that something is natural or synthetic has absolutely nothing to do with its properties. Its properties are determined by its molecular structure, not by where or how it was made. Whether a chemical was made by Mother Nature in a bush or by a chemist in a lab is irrelevant. What is relevant is what we know about that chemical. But we live in a sea of chemicals. The lunch that you're going to have contains hundreds and hundreds of different chemical entities. We secrete numerous compounds. Over 3,000 different compounds have been isolated from urine alone. And if you take a look at our sweat, our breath, our blood, saliva, we are, of course are all made of chemicals. The human body is nothing more than one large bag of chemicals. That doesn't sound so good to most people because they think that chemicals should be locked up somewhere in, in the laboratory. But life itself, is based upon chemical reactions which are going on in our body all the time. There are thousands and thousands of reactions catalyzed by enzymes that are going on all the time, which together constitute life. Well, obviously, since food is the only raw material that ever goes into our body, we are constructed of what we eat, of what goes into our body. So it makes sense, obviously, to take a careful look at what we eat because it must have some sort of uh, effect on our health. But one can look at that in many different ways. Because I could tell you that that apple is really a healthy thing to eat because it is full of antioxidants, it has all kinds of vitamins, it has all kinds of minerals. Or if I wanted to callously cherry pick some data, I could also scare you away from ever eating an apple. Let's give that a shot. When you bite into that apple, you know what you're tasting? This is what you're tasting. Those are not additives. They're not pesticide residues. Those are the building blocks of the apple. That's what it's made of. For example, you'll see some acetone. The last time you encountered acetone was probably on the label of your nail polish remover right above where it says, do not drink. Good <laughs> advice. Also in that apple, we have formaldehyde. You know what that is? That's embalming fluid. That's what morticians use to preserve bodies. Formaldehyde is a carcinogen. It's a known cancer-causing agent that can kill you. Acetone can kill you. So I can tell you, did you know that when you're eating an apple, you're really poisoning yourself with acetone. It can kill you, but it's an economical way to go because you'll be pre-embalmed. Well, that just might rub you the wrong way, but there's some rubbing alcohol in there as well, isopropanol. But we know that that apple is not hiding somewhere, just waiting to take a bite out of us. Although everything that I just told you is true, it does contain the acetone, it does contain the formaldehyde, it does contain the isopropanol. How come it's not dangerous? It's not dangerous because of the cornerstone of toxicology, first laid over 500 years ago by the great sage Paracelsus, who said only the dose makes the poison. Acetone is in that apple, but it's there in a trivial amount. In fact, the amount of acetone and formaldehyde and isopropanol we find in that apple in amount exceeds the pesticide residues that everyone worries about. So amounts, of course, matter. Someone can ask the question, is aspirin toxic? Well, it really doesn't make any sense because you know that aspirin, for example, is, is good for removing headaches. How much? If you take an aspirin tablet and you lick it, your headache will not go away. You take two tablets and swallow them, your headache will likely go away. If you take the whole bottle of tablets and swallow them, you will go away. So is aspirin toxic? It all depends on the context. Of course, context is what we need when we evaluate risk, and that is what we do every day. Maybe not consciously, subconsciously, you evaluate risk. You evaluate it whether or not it was worth coming here today, because you get into your truck, you drive here, you know that there's a risk. But 
hopefully the benefits outweigh that risk. We make these kind of decisions all the time in life. And in science, these decisions are based on what we call peer-reviewed literature. A researcher carries out a study, submits it to a journal, the journal sends it out to referees, it gets edited, they a lot of back and forth, eventually a decision is made on whether or not to, to publish it or not. It doesn't mean that everything that is published in a peer-reviewed journal is scientifically sound. We have the tragic example of Andrew Wakefield, who published that horrific, fraudulent paper in The Lancet, linking autism to vaccination, and that has spread like wildfire around the world. How did that happen? Because if you're a referee and you're asked to judge a paper, you have to assume that what is submitted is correct and they have done what they said they've done. You cannot redo the work. The research probably took years by many people. So you have to assume that the researcher is honest. When they're fraudulent, like Wakefield was, try to cheat an insurance company, submitted fraudulent data, it can take a long time until that comes to light. It happens when someone tries to duplicate the work and find that they can't. In this case, it took about 15 years. But by that time, we had epidemics of measles and whooping cough. We have children dying. Wakefield should be accused of manslaughter. But instead of that, he goes around speaking for $25,000 to large groups, slightly less than what I'm getting here. And uh, he, he convinces people of the dangers of vaccination. It's an absolutely horrific thing. He paints a picture of himself as a scapegoat uh, who is uh, being set up by pharmaceutical companies. So we can't always trust the peer-reviewed literature, but it is still the best way to go. However, unfortunately for most people, emotion outweighs the scientific logic. And that's how decisions are made. And I'll give you a very interesting example, a true story. For some of ladies who's playing golf on a course just outside of Montreal a couple years ago, early in the morning and a truck comes by and they feel the spray. They rush back into the, uh, into the clubhouse and they accost the greenskeeper and one of them tells them, gee, I got a headache from that spray. The other one says, I got a rash. And the third one had the most significant complaint of all, she just couldn't putt straight. Well, I'm sure that you already guessed the bottom line to this story. They did get sprayed, but of course it was with water. But they were so convinced that it was a pesticide, because they knew pesticides were sprayed on golf courses, that they actually got symptoms. Now to them, the symptoms were very real. But this is what we call the nocebo effect. If you believe that something can do harm, it actually can. The same way that if you believe something can do good, the placebo effect comes in, in handy. But in the business of trying to communicate the nuances of science to the public, we have to address this issue because there are many, many people who have false beliefs which actually causes them to have real anxieties and have real symptoms. And it can do real damage. So we have to make sure that the right information does get out there. And this, of course, includes information about an area that you are obviously very interested in, are pesticides. Well, any discussion of pesticides has to, of course, make clear that these are potentially dangerous substances. That's why they are used, because we are confronting pests. We're confronting insects, fungi, and weeds. And these are after the same food that we want to eat. We want to get rid of them. So, of course, pesticides are, are dangerous. No one is going to argue against that. And we get back to the story that I told you, that a chemical is not good or bad. It's all a question of how it is used. You can use it safely, or you can use it in a dangerous fashion. Well, these insects and other bugs, of course, are after exactly what we are after. So we are trying to protect ourselves. But we have to do it in a wise way. And that is, unfortunately, not always done. In many areas of the world, pesticides are used without full knowledge of how they should be used. In many cases, they can't even read the instructions. They don't realize that a substance has to be diluted before it is used. 
They don't know that you need protective equipment. Now, we don't see any of this kind of thing here in North America, because here you guys are well trained. And you know that when you're out there spraying, you're going to take proper precautions. And here is a, a North American farmer spraying, and of course he's all clad up. And you show this to the public, and of course people get all worried. They say, look, there's that farmer, he's wearing a hazmat suit, he's protecting himself, how are we protected from the, the chemicals that are, are out there? Well, I'll just point out that this farmer is actually an organic farmer, and uh, he's a cauliflower growing, and he's spraying a natural soap solution. Well, that soap solution can be just as harmful as any other pesticide. It gets into the lungs, it dissolves the mucus layer, and it can do terrible things. So whether it's a natural soap spray or not is, is really irrelevant. What is relevant is an evaluation of the risk that is associated with any such activity. And, of course, there is risk. There's no question that pesticides can kill not only pests, but people as well. However, most of these tragic cases are willful. Pesticides are commonly used for suicide in poorer areas of the world. And this is something, of course, that, that one has to be very cognizant of. We also have to realize that genetic engineering has had a big inroad here because when you have BT crops where the crops can protect themselves because they have been genetically engineered to ward off insects, it means that farmers are going to be buying less organophosphates, which are the ones that are classically used in these uh, suicides. But there is a risk, especially in the workplace, where workers, of course, are exposed to far greater amounts than, than the general public would ever be exposed to. And in farming communities, there are concerns. We know that there is somewhat of a higher incidence of Parkinson's disease in farming communities. The question is, why is that? What aspect of lifestyle? Well, it's possible that it's linked to certain pesticides, but whether these are organic or not is irrelevant. Rotenone, which is extracted from the roots of a plant, the dearest plant, is also linked to Parkinson's disease. So it's not a question of whether it's synthetic or natural. It's a question of what we know about that particular pesticide. But as you well know, uh, a farming lifestyle is quite different from an urban lifestyle. Uh, there are the diesel fumes that, that uh, you're exposed to, the, the uh, uh, much greater uh, chance of, of spending a lot of time outdoors, uh, breathing in, you know, uh, who knows what, molds and hay. I mean, there are all kinds of things that could potentially explain disease patterns. So just because you see more Parkinson's disease in areas where pesticides are used, of course, does not mean that the pesticides are responsible, but it does mean that this is worth looking into. And of course, PMRA, Pest Management Regulatory Agency in Canada, is charged with the task of doing exactly that, of looking into what is the safe way to use pesticides. And these chemicals are not just randomly put on the market. There is a tremendous amount of documentation that is required that has to be submitted to PMRA before a pesticide is registered. Today, it's all done electronically, but it used to be done on paper. Let me show you the amount of paper that had to be submitted for one pesticide. There it is. Years and years of work of gathering evidence on animal data, human data, etc., which then has to be submitted, and then PMRA makes a decision not only on whether or not the pesticide can be marketed, but how it is to be marketed, on what crops it can be used, how much of it, it can be used, under what conditions it can be used, how much exactly has to be applied per acre. So all of this is taken into account. Does it mean that it can be guaranteed to be safe in all conditions? No. Humans are biochemical individual. We react to things differently. But you do the best you can in order to make sure that substances could be used in a safe and effective way. It's, of course, not possible to, to know every effect. Yes, we can determine acute effects quite easily. I mean, you can determine very quickly whether or not that rat dies the next day when you give it some chemical. But subtle chronic effects, that's a completely different story. What is the, the relationship between giving an animal a large dose 
and seeing what happens in a very short time to humans having very small doses over many, many years. That's very difficult to know. And that's why, you know, we see these associations between pesticides and attention problems, between uh, weed killers like atrazine and, and developmental problems in, in, in animals. I mean, these, these are the things that can be measured, but how that really links to, to humans is really based on making educated guesses. One of the most controversial areas, as of course you well know, is, is the use of neonics uh, on, uh, on crops and whether or not this has an effect on the bee population. We know that we are at the mercy of the bee population. I mean, if bees disappear, we will disappear. That, that's quite clear. But experts don't even agree on whether or not this colony collapse disorder uh, is a real thing. I mean, it happens in some parts of the world periodically and, and not in, in others. There are all kinds of, of issues here, and there's no agreement even among the, among the experts. Uh, there are some interesting suggestions that perhaps it is the, the way that neonics use and on what crops they are used that's the problem, because when you are planting soy seeds, for example, it's not the same as when you're planting canola and you don't stir up the ground the same way. I mean, the neonics are seed coatings, and more may get into the air from certain farming practices. But we also know that, that bees are susceptible to mites, they're susceptible to viruses. So the current opinion seems to be that neonics may play a role in some situations on bee population, but they're not the only player. It's a question of what other sort of exposure there is. We just can't know for sure. And there's a tremendous amount of research on the way and on this. And of course, this, this highlights the fact that people gravitate toward organic because by definition in organic agriculture, you don't use any of these, uh, these pesticides. However, there are a lot of misconceptions among the public about organic agriculture. Now, I, I know, of course, that, that you, know, the, you guys know all the nuances here, but I speak to a lot of, of lay audiences where you have to point these things out because they are under the impression that if something is grown organically, there are no agrochemicals, there are no pesticides that are used, and that if they are making the decision to eat organic, it means they don't have to worry about fertilizers, they don't have to worry about pesticides. This, of course, is not the case. In organic agriculture, there are a lot of pesticides that are allowed to be used. The stipulation is that they must come from a natural source. Well, for example, copper sulfate. That can be used in organic agriculture because copper sulfate can be mined. It's a natural substance. But just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's safe. Arsenic compounds can also be mined. And of course, they are decidedly dangerous and they have been used as, as pesticides. Now, when PMRA approves a chemical, it is not approved on the basis of whether it's going to be used in organic agriculture or conventional agriculture. It is just approved or not approved. How one uses it is, is up to the user. So the risks and benefits of the chemicals that are used in organic agriculture are the same as with, with conventional agriculture. I mean, you have to examine which chemical and how these things are used. But here is one of the most curious things with BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis bacterium, which produces a, a protein that is toxic to insects. The organic farmer is allowed to spray their whole acreage with this bacterium in order to prevent uh, insect infestation because the protein will indeed do that. But should you take the gene that codes for that protein and insert it into a plant so that it can then produce the protein, that is not allowed in organic agriculture because that is genetic engineering which is not allowed. So it's okay to expose the crop to the 33 or so thousand genes that are present in that bacterium, but it's not okay to expose the crop to the single gene that produces the relevant protein. So these are the kind of things that need to be pointed out. Now, to be fair, it is true that conventional agriculture does use more pesticides than, than organic because there are more synthetic pesticides that are, are available. But it's not the number of pesticides that is an issue, although that is the 
portrait that is painted by the Environmental Working Group in Washington, which is a very effective activist uh, organization. They will, for example, scare the public by telling them that apples can have up to 36 pesticides, synthetic ones. That's true, because there are that many pesticides that are approved on apples. No farmer will ever use 36 pesticides on a crop. You use the ones that you really need. First of all, pesticides, of course, are expensive, so you want to limit the use. And let's face it, if there's a risk with pesticides, who is at greatest risk? You, right? You are exposed to much more than the traces that the consumer is exposed to. So, of course, no one wants to, to use these in a callous fashion. But a headline like that, that apples can contain 36 pesticides, residues, that is enough to scare the public. And this is what they do. But we have to remember that the presence of a chemical is not the same as the presence of risk. It's a question of which chemical and how much. Well, these days, the how much can easily be determined because we have the equipment. We have the mass spectrometers. We have the gas chromatographs. We can find trace chemicals in everything. You know what we're down to now? Parts per trillion. What's a part per trillion? It's one second out of 32,000 years. Think about that ratio. Or if you want a more visual representation, the width of a credit card, get this in your mind, the width of a credit card in the distance between the Earth and the Moon. We can find that with our sophisticated instrumentation. That's why I, I, I bug my analytical chemist colleagues. I tell them they're, they're responsible for all our problems because they're finding you know, chemical traces in, in everything. Well, finding something at the part per trillion level is in fact more than finding the needle in a haystack. It's finding that needle in a world full of haystacks. So if you knew that there's one needle in one haystack somewhere in the world, would you stay away from that good old fashioned roll in the hay? I suspect not, because you would determine that the benefits outweigh the risks, <laughs> right? And that is really what it all, all comes down to. But the EWG puts out every year a list of their dirty dozen of foods that contain the most pesticide residues that you should stay away from and buy only the organic version. But what they don't say is that how those chemicals relate to the acceptable daily intake. And the fact is that we know how they relate and that death does not lurk in the grocery aisle. How do we know this? Because we are capable of doing the measurements. And there are scientists, of course, who do this. And we know that while it is true that there may be pesticide residues, but they are far below the levels that anyone has shown to be dangerous. So just saying that there are 36 possible pesticide residues on apple is a totally scientifically meaningless statement. You want to determine exactly which residues and how much in comparison to the ADI. And when we do that, we find that the, the uh, Environmental Working Group just uses scientifically bankrupt arguments. But unfortunately, those are enough to scare the public. The Organic Consumers Association has a big say in policy in, in the US, a very, very loud group. And of course, everyone assumes that such associations are all, you know, they're philanthropic ventures, that they have no agendas on their own, and that they, they don't care about money. Well, you know, you have huge amounts of money involved in this industry. They buy advertising, they have agendas, just like everyone, everyone else. And they really spread a lot of fear. Here is something taken directly from their literature. U.S. factory farm meat, dairy, and poultry industry is an out-of-control system based on cruel, filthy, disease-ridden, and environmentally destructive animal prisons, GMO, pesticide-tainted feeds, etc., etc. I'm sure you know this. You've, you've seen this kind of drivel uh, often. And then they say that they need to be very aggressive to mobilize. So they don't just stand back. They are indeed very aggressive and very confrontational. And they portray themselves as you know, being kind of the shining knights in armor who are going to protect us from that unholy alliance between big food, big agro, big pharma, etc. Well, big organic is just as big as any one of those. 
One can also argue that there is value, of course, in using pesticides because you increase the availability of foods that we know have a chance of reducing cancer rates. We know for sure that eating more fruits and vegetables is a good thing to do. And we know that it is possible to make food much cheaper by growing it in a proper scientific fashion. So what is the problem here? The real problem is, is this confrontation that we're seeing all the time between so-called conventional farming and natural or organic farming. And there really does not need to be such a confrontation because everyone is interested in growing food in the best and safest possible way in the most economical fashion. And the truth is that there are different paths to do that. And they don't all work the same way in the same place. It is certainly possible through proper uh, IPM integrated pest management to produce food, but not the same way everywhere. For example, yes, it is possible to grow grapes organically in uh, California in a very effective way. It will be more expensive, but if you have the labor and you have the right climatic conditions, yes, it, it can be done. But it doesn't mean that it can be done somewhere else or it may be possible to, to grow conventional canola in one area of the world, depending on what the climate is, and not elsewhere. So it's not a yes or a no business. It all depends on how much effort one is willing to put in, what profit margins are, etc. But there's always more than one solution to a problem. But these days, that solution can certainly involve genetic engineering, and that really opens up a big can of, of worms for many people and gives rise to these kind of cartoons that are you know, so easily seen on the, uh, on the internet. It's a very frightening thing and I can tell you from experience that this is a difficult issue to try to discuss with the public. Toxicology by comparison is a simpler issue because most people can understand the dose makes the poison argument. However, with genetic engineering, it's not so simple because if you don't understand what a gene is or what proteins are or the basics of genetic engineering or recombinant DNA, it's very difficult to, to try to unconfuse the bewildered people out there. This kind of cartoon is very seductive because if people know anything about DNA, they know that it's important, that it's the blueprint of life and that cancer has an effect on, on DNA and that's a bad thing, so you don't want to fool around with DNA. That's you know, an understandable worry. What is not understandable is misleading facts, alternative facts, like this one. Monsanto, of course, has become the lightning rod for uh, all of the anti-GM people, which is also curious because, of course, there are many, many companies that produce genetically modified seeds but Monsanto is, is the great devil. Then this business about home of, of GMOs and Agent Orange is, is totally, totally uh, misleading. But it makes for a very compelling quack argument. Well, where does this come from? And I, I think it's important to spend a minute on trying to explain where this worry comes from about uh, Agent Orange and, and corn, because especially in the US now, the, I mean, this anti-GM publicity is, is, is everywhere. Agent Orange was uh, a defoliating agent that was sprayed in Vietnam to remove leaves from trees so that the Viet Cong could not hide under the trees. It was a weapon of war, obviously. The reason it was called Agent Orange is not because the chemical is orange, it is because it was shipped to Vietnam in drums with an orange band around them to identify them. And, uh, in an operation called Operation Ranch Hand, it was sprayed from airplanes on, on, uh, on, on the foliage. It was a mixture of two chemicals, 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. These are weed killers and they work extremely well. It turned out that during the manufacture of 2,4-5-T, of course no one knew this at the time, there was a side product that was produced. 
And that was the notorious tetrachlorodioxin, which is indeed a horrifically poisonous substance. Now, that wasn't known at the time. And of course, it still would not have caused a big worry because you're not going to worry about poisoning your enemy, right, when you're spraying uh, chemicals on them. I mean, that was part of the, the, the plan. However, uh, it turned out after the war that there were some American servicemen who had health problems that were being traced to Agent Orange. Well, the trace was to the contaminant in 245T, which was the dioxin. Now, I'm not going to go into the chemistry here. You'll just have to believe me that when you meant that when you synthesize 2,4-D, you cannot possibly have a side effect of tetrachlorodibenzodioxin. It cannot happen because the raw materials don't have enough chlorine atoms in them. But this is where the anti-Monsanto and anti-agent argument comes in because now there is a, a form of genetic modification that is used where plants have been made to resist the herbicide 2,4-D which is one of the most widely used herbicides. So the argument is that when you're using 2,4-D on these herbicide-resistant crops, you're exposing farmers and the public to the notorious agent orange dioxin. Well, this is chemical folly because the problem was with 2,4-5-T, which has not been manufactured since 1960. The problem was not with 2,4-D, but of course, it takes some explaining to get people to understand, uh, understand that. Vandana Shiva, who goes around the world talking about GMOs, of course, does not explain it the way that I've explained it. To her, she's a big activist, anti-GMO. GMO stands for God move over. She wants to ban synthetic fertilizer because it was a weapon of war. You know what she's talking about? She's talking about ammonium nitrate. One can argue that the Haber process for producing ammonia, which was discovered by Fritz Haber first years of the 20th century, one of the most important chemical discoveries ever. Because if you can take nitrogen and hydrogen and make ammonia, and from ammonia you can make fertilizer, of course, you can make urea, you can make ammonium nitrate, this was instrumental in the Green Revolution, saving millions and millions and millions of lives. But of course, ammonium nitrate can also be used as an explosive. The Oklahoma City explosion, of course, was based on ammonium nitrate. So because ammonium nitrate has that connotation, she does not want it to be used as fertilizer. And you know, as I always tell people, ammonium nitrate does not make that decision whether it's going to blow up a building or fertilize uh, soil. It's people who make these kind of decisions. She also tells us, that the graph of growth of GMO shows a correspondence with increase in autism. This is one of the biggest scientific follies that is out there. And this is one we really have to fight with great vigor. The notion that an association means cause and effect, in, that's her idea, which of course it does not. Glyphosate is a shining example where this information is misused. Yes, there is all kinds of information about glyphosate. Every week virtually, there's some new study that comes out talking about the fact that the benefits of this chemical outweigh the risks. And I'm sure you've seen many of these. But you can also make a plot like this about increase in autism, increase in glyphosate use, and it's very compelling to uh, a non-scientific public. Because there it is. I mean, the two factors go together. But of course, it's extremely important to point out that you can make all kinds of graphs, including linking autism to organic food sales. We don't, we don't think that that is really a cause and effect relationship because correlation is not the same as cause and effect. There's a very strong correlation between breast cancer and wearing skirts. Nobody thinks that skirts cause the disease, but it's obvious why there should be a correlation. But this is a very compelling argument. Glyphosate, the most widely used herbicide weed killer in the world. It certainly has no acute toxicity, and I'm sure that you've seen this claim all the time because the pesticide manufacturers make this claim. It's really a meaningless claim because nobody thinks that you're going to be exposed to a trace of, of glyphosate and drop dead the next day. I mean, that's not what the issue is. 
The question is whether or not exposure to trivial amounts over a long time is, uh, is a problem. So it's the chronic low-dose exposure that we are worried about. And the reason we're worried about, about that is because of the scare that was put out by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is an arm of the World Health Organization, so it's not a quack operation. And they rated glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen. Now, of course, as soon as you see that, you can understand why there would be panic among members of the, of the public. But this is an analysis that is based on hazard. It is not an analysis based upon risk. IARC classifies chemicals in four different groups. Group one, substances we know are carcinogenic, like tobacco, uh, for example. Then we have the probable ones, the possibly, the not classifiable. And interestingly enough, the only one that has ever appeared in group four is caprolactam, which is used in making of a type of nylon. That's the only one that has ever been classified as known to be non-carcinogenic, right? Because if you look at virtually anything, in some species of animal, at some dose, it can cause a problem. But hazard and risk are not the same. And if, if there's one thing that you go away from here today, now I know that you know much of what I'm talking about here, but if you go away from here and get this across to your friends and relatives who may not be aware of this, I think we will have accomplished something. Risk and hazard are not the same. An analogy is in order. A grizzly bear, probably the most dangerous animal on the face of the earth. One swipe of its claw can take off a human head. If you see it in a zoo behind a fence, you can admire this beautiful creature and have no worries at all. If you're out in the wild and you should meet up with a grizzly, quite a different story. Then you better start running fast, at least faster than one of your friends, right? Now the hazard has not changed because the hazard is the innate property of a substance or a process to do harm. Risk is a function of hazard taking into account exposure and means of exposure. So no doubt that the grizzly is hazardous, but risk, well, that's variable. The same thing with sunshine. Sunshine is inherently hazardous. We know that it can cause skin cancer. But we also know that we can protect ourselves against it and use it properly because it has benefits too. 15 minutes of exposure is enough to give you a proper dose of vitamin D. So extent of exposure is important. Now glyphosate, as I said, is in group 2A by IARC which means it's a probable carcinogen, but also in that group 2A are hot beverages. Because when you drink extremely hot tea, as they do in South America when they drink the mate tea, it increases the risk of esophageal cancer. So it is innately hazardous. Our risk is almost none. We do not drink coffee boiling hot, certainly not repeated times during the day. Also, Broiled, charcoal broiled meat is also in the same category as glyphosate, yet we eat it. And baked goods are also in the same category because when you bake wheat, you form small amounts of acrylamide, which is a known carcinogen. And hairdressing as a profession is also in the group 2A category. That's probable human carcinogen. In group one, Known human carcinogen is bacon that you had for breakfast this morning without giving it much thought. Why? Because I don't think many of you piled on a pound of bacon onto that plate. You may have had one or two strips. Well, it's true, it is a known carcinogen, probably because of the nitrites that are used in it, but you'd have to eat a large, large amount of bacon for that risk to manifest itself. So just because glyphosate has been put into that category, it does create a lot of fear. It doesn't mean that that fear is realistic. But this is the way that the activists portray it. They say it's a probable human carcinogen. It's the ultimate killing machine. Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who works at MIT, and of course that gives her credentials, even though she has no training in chemistry, in agriculture, or any relevant field, she has training in electrical engineering. 
but she has written all kinds of papers vilifying glyphosate. She links it to every possible disease that you have ever heard of. And uh, she publishes, and these are generally in the pay-for-play journals, you know, not, not your top-notch journals, but these days you can get just about anything published. Here she is linking it to, to autism. Here she links it to, to enzyme deficiencies. And in this case, as you can see, her colleague is Anthony Samsell, who labels himself independent scientist, basically means unemployed. And uh, he uh, portrays himself as really knowledgeable by picturing himself in front of the periodic table, which of course gives you the image of knowledge about chemistry. But just because someone pictures themselves in front of a periodic table doesn't mean that you have to believe what, uh, what they say. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense that is being said out there, but this is one that takes the cake. Uh, Senef says that the real reason that vaccines are dangerous is because they are contaminated by glyphosate. Now, it is possible that you might find some trace of glyphosate in, in, in a vaccine because you'll find it in anything at the part per trillion level. But to suggest that you should stay away from giving children vaccination because of possible glyphosate contamination is a criminal activity. Why do I say that? Because we can prove it. We know what our exposure to glyphosate is and we can put this into a relevant perspective because we can measure glyphosate exposure by measuring the amount that we find in our urine and that's a very valuable measurement. Over years and years of research, the acceptable daily intake of glyphosate has been determined to be half a milligram per kilogram of body weight. That would translate to four milligrams showing up per liter of urine if we had maximum exposure. Well, you know what? We can measure the amount in the urine. It's one to three micrograms, which means that that is one thirteen hundredth the acceptable daily intake. So there really is not an issue with this based on numbers. And science, of course, works on numbers, but the public works on emotion. They work on portrayals like this, that genetic modification is the great evil. They hype the fact that something is not genetically modified. Misleading. There are no genetically modified tomatoes on the market. So all tomatoes are non-GMO. Are there potential problems with this technology? Of course there are. We already are seeing resistance to glyphosate, resistance to BT. This is not because of the technology. This is biology. That's the way it works. It was clear that eventually there would be resistance that develops. And you know, no one is surprised by that. The New York Times not long ago had a major article that GM has not delivered on its promise. Well, they cherry picked the data. The fact is that when you do a meta-analysis, a study of studies, what you find is quite different. What you find is that GM technology has reduced pesticide use, has increased crop yields, it has increased profits for, for farmers. That's what the real data shows. But that's not what makes the news. This is what makes the news. And this makes the news, especially in Europe, where people are absolutely terrified of genetic modification, thanks to the work of a researcher in France who supposedly showed that genetic modified corn causes tumors in animals. These pictures scooted like wildfire around the world with the tumor on the animal that was fed the GM corn and not the other. This was totally misleading because it turned out there were just as many tumors in the placebo group. Uh, of course, he didn't show a picture of that. Uh, Gilles Eric Serolini is the researcher here. And um, his paper, originally submitted, has been withdrawn. He labels himself as, you know, the champion of the common people. But the fact is that his study had to be retracted because it turned out not to be scientifically sound. He doesn't give up though. Believe it or not, even though the European Food Safety Authority has said that this is humbug, it cannot be reproduced, he sticks by it. And not only that, he has doubled down. He has come out with a homeopathic remedy for glyphosate poisoning. This is unrivaled stupidity. 
Uh, homeopathy is the most absurd of all the alternative practices. Non-existent molecules do not have an existing effect. It's as simple as that. And to suggest that you have a non-working homeopathic solution against a non-problem is the ultimate in, in, in nonsense. But it's out there. He's selling his homeopathic anti-glyphosate remedy. In North America, we've not gone quite that nuts. And uh, here, though we do have a problem, this non-GMO great nuts. Well, it's non-GMO. It also has no vitamin A, D, B12, or riboflavin, which previous versions of grape nuts did. Why? Because those vitamins are produced commercially by genetically engineered bacteria. And because they are involved in the process, they cannot be in a product that is set to be GMO-free. So now we're getting less nutritious cereal, but it is GMO-free. The European Food Safety Authority of course, has also come out saying that uh, glyphosate is, is, is no problem. Uh, we do want to keep an eye on this technology, of course, because we don't really know everything about it and what the future may bring. But you can cherry pick your data, as I did in this case, and find a paper, again in the peer-reviewed literature, that shows that glyphosate actually has an anti-cancer effect and that we should be increasing our intake of glyphosate. Well, this, of course, is just as much nonsense because what we need to do is look at the overall picture. And the overall picture is as recognized by regulatory agencies around the world, like the European Chemical Association, that the argument that glyphosate is a human carcinogen just does not have scientific validity. And just a couple of days ago, uh, sort of a hollow victory in Europe, when the uh, use of glyphosate was approved for another five years, whereas it could have been 15, but it was, uh, it was approved. However, not everyone is happy, and uh, Macron, the president of France, has said that they are going to ban glyphosate no matter what the European Union says. But another issue that comes up is, all right, if you're going to ban it, what are you going to use instead? And their answer is things like, like pelargonic acid, which is non anoic acid. Well, yeah, it does work. In some cases, it will kill the leaves that are above ground. But unlike glyphosate, it's not going to have an effect on, on, on the whole plant. But it's sellable because this is found in nature. It's found in flowers. And therefore, people think that you know it's safe. Well, poison ivy, of course, is safe, but it's, it's dangerous. You don't want to go around rolling in it, even though it's perfectly natural. Finally, there's the question of the right to know. And this is, it's a seductive argument because of course everyone wants to know what's in their food. You want to know if there's any genetic modification, whether or not it is because of the risk involved or because you're just philosophically opposed to it. But let's say you have a label like this, salad dressing, and you have soybean oil in there. Well, if that soy comes from genetically modified soy, let's say, you know, herbicide resistant soy, then this should be labeled as some sort of GMO. But that oil has no vestige of the genetic modification which was present in the original seed. There's no way that any chemist anywhere can tell the difference between that oil and any other oil because it does not contain any genes. It does not contain any protein. It's just fat. So if there is no difference, then what would you be labeling for? Because as soon as you put a label, it implies that there's a reason for labeling it, that there's something that needs to be known for some reason. But if it's equivalent, why would you label it? If someone is philosophically opposed to genetic modification, you can always buy organic, because by definition, you can't have genetic modification. But of course, what we really have to understand is life is full of risks. No matter what you do, there's some risk. You can be out for a casual walk, Terrible things can happen. Oh, don't go, oh, we're nice people, we faked it. They're fine. But they are not the innocent little creatures that you think that they are. <laughs> no matter what, there's always some risk associated with an activity. But when people take their own risk, they don't worry about it. It's when they feel that a risk is imposed on them. That's when they become very alarmed. 
You can cherry pick data these days to show anything you want to show. Uh, but that's a very dangerous business. That's why what we try to do is look at all of the evidence that has accumulated because no matter what, you will always find some contrary argument. The question is having a proper balance of arguments. You can find anything. You can find an argument that tells you that if you avoid meat, you're going to be healthy. You can also find a paper that will prove that you want to eat bacon for breakfast every day because that's the salvation to, to health. You can find it all. Aristotle, I think, said it best, that the best things are placed between extremes. Moderation is the answer. Moderation in everything, including moderation. Because life is more than just worrying about every drop that you drink and every bite of food that you take. We have to put everything into context and weigh the risks against the benefits. And taking no risk is the biggest risk of all. So I want to leave you with that last last idea that we can't turn our back on the novel technologies like genetic modification, even though we don't always know every possible outcome. For example, we know that there's hope there for celiac friendly bread. You can genetically modify wheat so that it has less gl gluten. There's hope for coming up with corn that contains more methionine through general, to genetic engineering because you know that methionine is produced in huge amounts as an animal feed because it is one of the amino acids that is missing in most, most grains. All right, so we can do that. Now to our analogy. Doing that is very much like watching the Wright brothers' first flight. If you were there in Kitty Hawk in 1904, you would have seen this rickety contraptions kind of bounce along for 100, 200 meters. But once you saw that, you knew that within a short time, it would be more sophisticated, you'd be flying village to village, city to city. But you did not have to be there to know or to witness a crash to know that such a thing is possible. Something goes up into the air, it might not come down the way you want it to come down. Right? Well, this is where we are with genetic modification. We're at the beginning of this technology. It's only been around, what, 30, 40 years. We've seen what it can do. The principle has been demonstrated. Are there going to be stumbling blocks somewhere along the road? Undoubtedly, that's how science works. Science is a race towards a finish line, but the finish line is also slowly going away from you. But we're always getting closer and closer to it. Even the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in Rome not one of your most liberal organizations, agrees that science should be put to the benefit of mankind because we are looking at a world where pretty soon the birth rate is going to be such that there will be 10 billion people in the world and they will want to eat. They will be coming to dinner. And we have to think of ways to do that. I'm not going to tell you that GM is the ultimate way. It's one of the tools that farmers can use. It's not the ultimate answer. It's one of the answers. And this is why I think it's so important to point out, obviously not to you, but to the public at large, that what you guys do is the most important thing that happens in the world because everything revolves around food. And whereas just a few years ago, 70% of the world was involved in making, in, in growing food, now you guys make up 2% of the population. And that's because of the tremendous growth in technology. So we chemists have to take some credit there too for supplying all, all these uh, agrochemicals. But you know what? This is not what people want. They don't want the scientific sounding argument. What they want is magic. What they want is miracles, they want to be told that everything is safe. There are no doubts about everything. Well, you know what? The only place that you're ever going to see magic is on the stage. And I've been doing that, oh, since I was a kid. When uh, I was in, in grade six, which actually was a couple years ago, uh, I was invited to a, a birthday party. And the parents of the kid whose birthday it was had hired a magician to entertain us. He was a teenager, but to us he looked like an accomplished pro. Most of the tricks he did were eminently forgettable, but one was memorable and life-changing. 
believe it or not. He showed us a rope, flexible rope. And he said, you know, I can make that rope defy gravity. And all I need is a magic chemical. And he reached into his pocket to get his magic chemical, which he then sprinkled on the rope. And believe it or not, that rope defied gravity. Now, I knew that this wasn't done with any magic chemical. I knew that if I tried to handle that rope, that's what would happen. Whereas he, with his magic chemical, well, he was able to perform miracles. I didn't know how. I knew it wasn't done with any magic chemical. But I wondered, why did he use this expression? Incidentally, only ropes I can do that to, so don't get all... <laughs> why, why did he use this expression? Why not alakazam or hocus pocus or abracadabra? So I went to the school library, I took out a book on chemistry, took out a book on magic, and I followed both of those ever since. And you might think that that's a very bizarre thing, you know, to follow, because chemistry, of course, firmly rooted in laws of nature, magic is ethereal. But the link between the two is that both have a scientific explanation. Everything a magician does has a scientific explanation. That rope certainly does. Hopefully, you'll never find out. But in chemistry, of course, it looks magical, but we try to, to unravel the magic and, and uh, take the magic out and replace it with science. But I'll leave you with one last analogy, because I think this is an important one on how we look at science. What I have here is this bizarre contraption, which has straight edges and hinges. And the question is, how many different shapes I can make? Obviously, a square. I can make a parallelogram, triangle. I can make two triangles, pentagon. Question is, can I make a circle? Well, what does logic tell you? We have straight edges and hinges. There's no way that you can make a circle out of that, right? But one thing in science is that we always have to explore. You don't take anything at face value. Because sometimes you have to think outside the box. You have to think in a different dimension. And you'll find that something that at first you thought was impossible, in fact, is possible if you look at it in a different way. So that's why we have to be careful not to dismiss something just because it doesn't fit our paradigm. I don't mit dismiss homeopathy because it has an implausible, ridiculous explanation. I dismiss it because numerous studies have shown that it does not work. So science is always based upon evidence. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that it never provides certainty. So I hope that I started my career really with a role. And I want to end here with you. I hope that I've been able to uh, unravel some of the mysteries uh, of science for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Incidentally, if you uh, would like any uh, further uh, info, we do have, uh, well, we do have uh, a website. And of course, Facebook and everyone must tweet these days. Well, I could listen to Dr. Joe all day, and uh, I'm sure he must have some of the most popular classes at university all the time. And, you know, it's just interesting that we've come so far in technology, and yet really we're not that far off the days of the old snake oil salesman. You know, we're not that far. Um, you know, I know we're, it's coffee time, but does anyone have a, a question for Dr. Joe while, while we're here? You know, I think we've really... Uh, been given some valuable tools by you today, but I guess we get frustrated and angry, but when we're confronting some of these fallacies, is it better to try and talk emotion, or how do we kind of, you know, tackle them? What's, do you have any words of advice about how we can take some of the information you've told us and effectively share it to help, you know, fight some of the, uh, the false science that's out, or false uh, perceptions that are out there? Excellent question, of course, and we deal with this all the time. I'll tell you, one thing that does not work is confrontation. Uh, 
It just doesn't. Uh, no matter what stupid thing someone might be saying. How many of you, for example, are familiar with the food babe? Okay, a fair number. The food babe is, is really just a ridiculous person who has no scientific education whatsoever, zero scientific education. But she has a huge number of followers on her website because, you know, she's into this all natural everything and she's a nice looking lady. She has a lot of followers. But, and I've had, you know, interactions with her. It does not work to be confrontational. What does work, I find, is that you give them the rope to hang themselves. <laughs> is that you pose questions that begs an answer for which they cannot possibly give a, a you know, an answer like, like you know, uh, well, okay, you, you, you don't like uh, glyphosate, you don't want it in your life, all right, tell us what we should be doing. And you'll see that, you know, they, they become tongue-tied because they, they've never thought about uh, such things. So I think the important thing is to ask about, ask them questions and then they, they usually cannot come up with any kind of, of answer, but you will never defeat emotion by just railing off scientific facts. That just doesn't work. But what does work is to try to get them to buttress their arguments, which they usually can't. Ah, very sound advice. Uh, any other, I'll give you one last shot. Okay, well, thank you so much for expanding our horizons and, and really giving us a lot to think about and arming us with some very valuable tools and just always uh, so inspiring to listen to you. So thank you, Dr. Joe Schwartz.